because I think what we're going to do tonight is answer perhaps some of the questions that you may have. So if you can remember all the way back to last week, whether you're here on Saturday or on Sunday, whatever service you normally come to, and it's fine to hop around, by the way. If you can't make it on Saturday, come on Sunday. All of you should come on Wednesday because Wednesdays are amazing. They're like, yeah. yeah. But what we started talking about last week was this whole idea of how God directs us in life. And so I asked the question last week, how many of you... Uh, you've ever asked God, what do you want me to do? And I asked for a show of hands. Everybody raises their hands because this is a question we always ask. It's like, what in the world am I supposed to be in life? Am I supposed to go to the military? Am I supposed to get married? Am I supposed to like, <laughs> right? There's this whole big bad world out there with so many options. And it can be very intimidating. And so as a Christian, it is totally okay and totally appropriate for you and I to ask God, what do you want me to do? And so just as a way of a recap, I want, I want to uh, just remind us of a couple things. This generation, your generation growing up, is, it is being called one of the most indecisive generations ever. The most indecisive generation ever. And it's not because you're less intelligent, because you're not. You're really smart, you're really good looking, you're educated, you do all these things. A main contributing factor to the reason why this generation is so indecisive is because there are so many options. So many options. Think about the eating experience a few years ago, 1800s, Cowboys and Indians. If you wanted to go to a restaurant, where would you go? Saloon. There was one restaurant in town, it was with the saloon, right? And so you went in and you could have whatever they made that day. You're like, I'm hungry, feed me. That was it, there's no options, you know? If you wanted coffee, there was no lattes. Could I get that non-fat milk, you know? It was just black, you know what I mean? You want coffee? Here, you know? There was no options. You just yes or no to yes or no. And it's easy. Well, now you walk into Starbucks, and I pulled a report one time how many different things you can order at Starbucks. It's like 18-something thousand. <sighs> That's a lot of options. Whataburger even. You know, on that commercial not too long ago, there's like, you can have your Whataburger however million ways you want it. Toasted buns, dry, plain, all the way. You know, all these different options. You can get it. They have all the stickers to label it. Whataburger is a beautiful thing. But the point is, there's options. I threw this out last week. You want to go to school, higher education beyond high school. There's options. You can go anywhere. You can do an exchange program. You don't even have to go to school in the United States. How cool is that? It's amazing. It's cool. But that's, okay, do you want to do that? Do you want to stay local? If you stay local, we got two options. You can go online. You can do a mix of both. You could do a, a gap year. You can travel or you know, just, oh. And so you're paralyzed sometimes. Some people are paralyzed. You're paralyzed by indecision. Because you're like, I just don't know what to do. And so what we talked about last week was, before we ask the question, God, what do you want me to do? Which is a great question. We have to first decide who we are going to become. Because if you're not passionately living for God, eh, it's hard for him to guide you and direct you. What you have to do first is you have to live passionately for God. If you're passionate for him and you're 100% sold out for him, and you're like, God, I'm going to be a Christian, where are you? make me into the person that you want me to be. If you do that, then it's so much easier for him to guide you and direct you. To guide you and direct you. I don't know if you've ever been to like one of those carnivals where you, you drive the little cart thing. Sometimes the bumper cars, but bumper cars probably a bad illustration. But like there's a, a go-kart, one of those. Have you ever ridden go-karts? Go-karts do not have power steering, right? They're, they're power steering, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's no hydraulics. And so if you're in a go-kart, tell me if this is true or false, and you're stopped, and you try and turn the wheel, is it easy or hard? Or harder, not a trick question, right? You're like, especially if you're a little kid. You know, I got little kids, and so they're like, no, they're putting all their body weight up, and they're like, Bleh. you know, they're turning this wheel. But something amazing happens. If you give the go-kart a little gas, a little boom, boom, and you get a little momentum, is it easier or harder to turn the, the same wheel is it easier or harder whenever you're moving? Easier. So much easier. It's like magic. I learned to drive on a, a, a little Nissan single cab, stick shift, manual stick shift, <laughs> uh, truck, no power steering except the guns, you know what I'm saying? And so I learned that I was dying, right? I'm trying to parallel park and I'm sitting there and stop and then I'm like, ah, ooh, ah, I got my arm pump going. Ah. And finally my dad looks at me and he's like, hey, just roll the car a little bit. Like give it a little, ooh, give it a little gas. As soon as I did that, I could say, amazing. You can turn the car so much easier, right? Any of you have that experience? 
No, because everything's automatic in power steering nowadays. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for 2017. But anyway, the point is this. When the vehicle's in motion, it's easier. It's easier to direct the vehicle once it's in motion. And I would say the same thing is true for our lives. It is easier for God to direct us, guide us, whenever we're in motion. Versus somebody who just sits back and is like, God, what do you want me to do? You didn't speak. Okay. <laughs> That's it. No, it's like, do something. You volunteer, lead. God, if you don't know what to do, I've said this before, but if your parents are in a field, you should know that field backwards and forwards. Especially if they own their own business. I'm not saying you have to do their business, but you should take advantage of that learning opportunity. Seriously. Whatever it is, you should just know it. You should figure out how it works and learn it because what is going to happen is it's either going to confirm like, yeah, I think I could actually do this. One day I could take over the business. Or, mm-mm, not doing this. God did not wire me like this, right? Some of you have parents in the medical field and you pass out of the sign of blood. Probably a good sign you're not supposed to be in the medical field, right? But whatever it is, you should figure it out. You should ask questions. You should do internships. You should Google like crazy. Figure these things out because it's easier for God to guide you when you're in motion and definitely when you're a passionate Christian versus you just sitting on your butt and doing nothing. Make sense? Fair? All right. So we'll, we'll keep going with this. Another reason, let me just throw this up. Another reason why we are sometimes paralyzed by indecision is because of insecurity that comes as a direct result of social media. Let me talk about this. Okay, let's take Instagram as the, the model. Okay, how many of you are active on Instagram? Just show of hands. Anybody? A few. <clears throat> Fair. Snapchat? Okay, same. So some of you are like, social media is dumb. <laughs> cool. It's cool. It's cool. Here, here's what can happen, especially with Instagram. Sometimes people are very honest on Instagram, meaning they'll post a picture of like a terrible hair day and they're like, eh, eh, you know, they'll laugh at themselves. But most of the time, if you see somebody post a picture of themselves on Instagram, is it them having a bad hair day or looking their very best? Their very best, right? They take a picture after the football game, right? And the girls do the whole like thing. I don't know what this is, but they like, you know, the leg, you can't take a straight leg picture. It has to be, you know, anyway. They do that, the, everything is perfect, you put a filter on it, it's amazing. So what happens is you're at home, not at the football game, you just downed a bag of Cheetos because you're depressed about something, right? And so you're sitting there, you feel fat and ugly, <laughs> and you see her doing this, and her hair is beautiful, and she's a cheerleader or whatever, right? And you're like, <clears throat> and you compare her highlight to your reality. Anybody on Pinterest? This is more of an old per- older person thing, right? I know, I know, but the same example applies, so don't laugh at me. But Pinterest, Pinterest has all these amazing ideas. Amazing. You want to decorate your room? Get on Pinterest. So many cool ideas. You want to learn how to cook? Get on Pinterest, right? So there's this whole Pinterest thing. And so typically the recipe is there if you're cooking something or how to build it, your DIY project, or I think I got that backwards. Do it yourself. DIY. There you go. And so what happens is you're like, ooh, I want to do that. I want to cook that. And so you follow a recipe and you do it. And the picture on Pinterest is amazing. It looks like Martha Stewart made it, right? You try it. And Martha killed it, you know what I'm saying? But like, the whole thing collapses, it's burned on one side. It's like, right? it's terrible. And so you, it, it's a Pinterest fail, you know? And so always, my point is this, all we see online is typically, typecasting, but typically really cool, really awesome. Even on Snapchat, like, it's me and my friends having fun. We're at Bahama Books. You're like, I want to be at Bahama Books. I've been Bahama Books like one time. Why didn't you invite me to go to Bahama Books, right? And so we compare ourselves and we can become insecure and indecisive. Anyway, I'll move on. When it comes to figuring out God's direction for our life, there's a couple of really simple, very practical things that we can do, and that's what I'm going to give you tonight. But before I do that, let me prove a point to you. The point is this. Even the most spiritual people, many times, do not know exactly what the future holds. So if you thought to yourself, how come God isn't speaking to me? I just want you to know you're normal and there's nothing wrong with you. Example, the Apostle Paul. 
one of the most spiritual dudes to ever walk the face of the earth. This is what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 16, three verses. Check this out. He said, I'm going to read it and then we're going to highlight some words. But listen for the indecisiveness and uncertainty in this passage. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective, effective work is open to me, and there are many who oppose me. So if you're just reading your Bible in the morning, you're like, okay, whatever. But look at this passage. This is the Apostle Paul. He had visions of the future. He wrote a bunch of the Bible, right? God used this guy to do miracles. Amazing. You would think if anybody knew the direction of his life, if anybody was like in tune to God, if God was ever going to speak to anybody, it would be the Apostle Paul. But look again at what he says. Perhaps. If you say perhaps, it's because you don't know. Are we going to Whataburger afterwards? Yes. That's a for sure answer. If I say perhaps, that does, that's not a for sure answer, right? That more like means like, no, but I'm just, I don't want to break your heart. So perhaps, maybe, right? Yeah. Anyway. He says, perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter. He's indecisive. He doesn't know if he's going to be there a little bit or the whole winter. He doesn't know. So you can help me on my journey wherever I go. That means he doesn't know where he's going. That means God hasn't specifically spoken to him and said, go there and preach there and then go there and preach there. He doesn't know. Look at verse 7. I don't want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope. That means he doesn't know. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. That means God hasn't spoke yet. He doesn't know. He doesn't know if he's going to go there. God hasn't spoken. There's uncertainty. But I will stay on in Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door of effective work is open to me and there are many who oppose me. Even the Apostle Paul had enemies. People that were against him. So if you're here tonight and you have ever felt insecure, like, man, God doesn't speak to me. God speaks to them, not to me. Something must be wrong with me. They pray and God like, leads them and guides them. They know exactly what they're supposed to do. Doors open for them. What's wrong with me? Do my prayers not work? Do I not have the secret sauce? Like, what? do I need a, a Jesus back home? Like, what? what is this, right? No, you're about on the same playing field as the Apostle Paul. That's a good playing field to be on. He didn't know. There were times where God spoke and led. There's times where it seems like God is silent. And that's normal. So I'd like to just eliminate insecurity from your mind tonight. Okay? And with that as the backdrop, I want to give you just some practical ways on how to make decisions and kind of figure out God's leading for your life. Okay? Good? Everybody tracking? Kind of understand what we're getting at? All right, here we go. I want to talk about wisdom. Wisdom. The beautiful example given to us in Scripture is from a man named Solomon. Solomon became king. God appeared to him in a dream. Dreams are sometimes spiritual. Many times dreams are just a result of, like, you watching a scary movie the night before or eating bad pizza, one or the other. But in this case, the dream was spiritual. God comes to Solomon in a dream and says, hey, I'll give you whatever you ask for. Solomon asked for wisdom, and God gave him tremendous wisdom. The Bible says he was the wisest man to ever live. Interesting. The wisest man to ever live wrote this statement in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. He says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can ever do. And whatever else you do, do uh, develop good judgment. Here's the deal. You ever seen Aladdin? Right? You know, no wishing for more wishes, or you know, many, a lot of people supposedly in Aladdin they, they blow it. They're like, give me your ten thousand dollars. Okay, well, what happens when you spend it? It's kind of Solomon's deal. Solomon could have asked for riches, he could have asked for victory over his enemies, but instead he goes to something that will last forever and actually influence those other areas. He asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him. Genius. And so I want to talk about wisdom tonight, ways to gain wisdom, because many times wisdom will give us direction. What I mean is, wisdom will help us make the right God decision. What am I supposed to do with my life? God is probably not going to come down and spell it out for you in this big voice. Do, 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 do. But he will give you wisdom, and this is what we're going to talk about. So I don't want to get ahead of myself. Number one, if you're taking notes, which I encourage you to. Number one is walk. Walk. 
walk in wisdom. Here, here we go. This is the verse, and it'll make sense. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. It says, walk with the wise and become wise, for companion of fools suffers harm. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. I'll give you a beautiful illustration of this. There's this guy named Craig. <clears throat> Craig was a party animal in college. He's older now. But party, I mean, just, that's what he lived for. Not a Christian, just, no, you know, anything and everything. Well, he had a pretty dramatic encounter where he gave his life to God, and he decided, I'm going to live my life for God. And he started praying, God, you lead me, guide me, lead me, guide me. Well, God's not going, okay, Craig, this is what you do. But Craig was really smart. And so what he did is he looked at his life and he's like, you know what? One day, I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great dad. I don't want to be in debt. I kind of want to be financially secure. I want to, I want to do that. I know for sure I want to do those things. And so he looked at his friends, the people that surround him, his, his college friends. He's like, yeah, you're going to be a terrible dad. <laughs> You're cheat on everybody, so you're not going to be a great husband, and nobody has money. So this isn't going to work. I have to walk with the wise. And so he went out, and he found this guy who treasured his wife. He was just around him. He was like, man, they have an unbelievable marriage. And so he literally kind of pestered the dude, like, hey, can you hang out? i got like a million questions to ask you. And so he really made friends with this guy who's an amazing husband, greatly influenced his life. He looked at another, another guy. He's an unbelievable dad. It's just a great relationship with his kids. He's a little bit older, and he's like, okay, I got I to gotta hang out with this guy. So he starts hanging out with him, asks him a million questions, kind of became his mentor. He ran into another guy that was actually a professor at his university who's just very financially savvy. In college, he starts asking him, he's like, okay, here's what I want to do. I don't want to be bound. I don't want to be limited because I'm in debt and school debt and all this money, and I'm always broke. And I'm like, starving, right? Like, I can't even buy pizza. I'm a college kid. Ramen. But, you know, just, I had nothing. And so the guy gave him some amazing advice. He's like, okay, you could pay rent, and you could use all this money to do this, or you could buy a house, this little house, and you could get three roommates. Essentially, they're going to pay for you. You're going to live for free, and then you can reinvest that. By the time Craig finished college, he had four rental properties. They rented to college students. He still owns them to this day, and they're, it's amazing. Just, but the point is, he figured out, okay, my college friends are going to teach me nothing about money because they're just as bad at it as I am. So I'm going to get around some people that are really good with money. What he's doing is that verse in Proverbs. He's walking with the wise. He's hanging out with them. He's learning from them. Right? You can look at your friends. You, you probably are into the same things that your friends are into. If you like sports, what do they like? If you're really smart, you're, you're, you're into all that techie stuff, you're into video games, whatever you're into, yeah, you have a lot of common things in this. Okay, well, the same thing applies. If your friends are idiots and you're hanging out with them, their idiocy is going to rub off on you, right? They're going to look at you like, hey, we have a great idea. We're going to go vandalize something. You're going to be like, okay. You know, like, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today's a great day to vandalize something. You know, idiots get together and they do stupid things. So the point of Proverbs is, hey, walk with the wise, and you'll grow smarter, wiser. It rubs off on you. Same thing as spiritually. Spiritually, if you want to be smart, hang out with spiritual people. Do the task. Get, with, get around some people that are just really spiritual, because that stuff rubs off on you. Make sense? Yes. Yo, so quiet tonight, but I'm trying hard. Let me give you another statement. It is almost impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. That's good. It is almost impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. That's spiritually. Yeah. I think we're okay. <laughs> it's almost impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. So take that to heart. Number two. You good? Number two. What did Craig do? He got around the right people, but then he didn't just, you know, sit in close proximity to them. Hey, hey. No, he asked them good questions. He starts asking, hey, how do I do this? What do I do? This is why I said earlier, if your parents own a business, ask them questions. Learn whether or not you want to be in that field or not. There's so much you can learn from them. And by the way, your parents like to talk to you, and they like when you open your mouth and talk to them. I know it's lame. But if you came up and you're like, mom, 
tell, tell me about what you do. She'd be like, okay, right? And it's, it's going to be so good. Just trust me, right? Ask. Ask. We should also ask God for wisdom. Beautiful verse in the Bible. You ready for this? James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom. Can we have an honest moment real quick? How many of you identify with me? I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand in advance. How many of you feel just like really subpar and kind of like dumb sometimes? Like, oh. <laughs> you know, somebody gives you a project and you're like, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. This verse is for us. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, mm, 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 mm. if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I can't tell you how many times. I've prayed in the morning. I like to pray in the morning. God, give me wisdom for today, because I don't know. Something happens, and I have almost this, like, out of Micah body experience where I say something really good, and I was like, oh, that was God. That just gave me that whole wisdom thing. Bible works. You should try it. This is a prayer that we can pray every day. God, give us wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. On every level. In, in class, give me wisdom to know how to pass this thing, right? Give me wisdom to know how to talk to the teacher. You got a friend issue thing going on? God, give me wisdom on how to do that. Give me wisdom on this relationship. Give me wisdom for the future, where, where to go, what school to go to. Give me wisdom. It's a beautiful prayer that he loves to answer. Yeah. Let's keep going. Number three. Feel. So we got walk, ask, feel. I'll explain You've heard me say this a thousand times, but I, I just believe you need to be reminded of this. And you guys ask me this all the time, so I'm going to keep talking about it, okay? I believe one of the greatest ways that God speaks to you is not in an audible voice. My God, you should do this. I like that. It's right here in my heart. And how I feel about a situation. Some people uh, call this their gut reaction. Like, I don't know. You've experienced this, right? Friend comes up, hey, my parents are out of town. You want to come over this weekend? <sighs> okay, what is that? Are you having a bowel movement? Or is that something deeper? Right? It's, it's something deeper. There's this uncertainty, and I can give you a Bible verse.